I've had students who told me they really didn't ever think they would amount to anything um, realize that, hey, I could do this and that it's uh, not beyond my grasp. I think this helps shape their future. Um, I always look at them and we don't know who might be a future astronaut because of this. For most students at Tanana Middle School, May 7th is a typical school day. It's really poopy, really chilly, and really gross. But for one team of 7th graders, school is out. Line up your personal bags and we'll get ready to mow the bus with you. Out on the road, that is. We're getting ready to bust out of here and go on a four-day science expedition. So if any of that stuff needs to go on the bus, get it up here, please. And while we can't do everything on expedition, we can take students out and open up the world of science to them. Everybody go get your warm weather stuff. We need to get warm weather stuff. It's exciting. Yeah, it should be fun. I'm excited because we get to go on a boat trip and we get to go to a water park. I think it's pretty important for us because it's a major part of our grade and it's a fun way to get the grade. After I saw the Titanic, um, I don't like boats anymore. One of my biggest fears is homesickness because I have a problem with being away from home. This is the story of the Tanana Soaring Eagles and their traveling middle school. Willie and Carissa, you guys are in front of Mr. Nuneman. Patrice Lee has taught in Fairbanks for 20 years. Field trips inspired her to study math and science when she was in middle school. I just feel it's important for students to be doing science. Um, it can frankly become very boring to sit in a classroom and just uh, work on worksheets or read it from the book. You just don't get the full impact that way. Okay, uh, welcome aboard the Soaring Eagles flight to uh, Kenai, Seward. Not a non-stop flight. We will be stopping in Cantwell and occasionally along the way. Uh, Lee's team partner is Robin Ward, who teaches English and Social Studies. Ward grew up in Fairbanks when such trips were not available. This is an experience that I never had, certainly when I was in school. Robin's back right here. You got a haircut, dude. Technology is advanced enough that you see it on TV, you read about it, we hear about it, but to actually go and experience it is so valuable for the kids. It's a lot better than just sitting around in class. The class is headed 600 miles south to the Challenger Learning Center of Alaska, the Nikiski Pool, Kenai Fjords Tours, and the Sea Life Center. There they will try on the roles of astronauts, mathematicians, and marine scientists. A 12-hour ride on the bus with 50 middle school students. That might be somebody's definition of insanity, but it's actually not too bad. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day in my neighborhood. Would you be mine? Would you be mine? We just sort of uh, write and learn and sing and watch our way all the way to, to Kena. But to be good explorers, the students needed preparation, especially in space science. Okay, good morning, everyone. Let's start with... Uh, For weeks before leaving, Lee presented lessons sent by the Challenger Learning Center of Alaska. The mission Lee chose is Rendezvous with a Comet, which is based on a real NASA project. That's where we will attempt to find a comet and launch a probe and uh, retrieve cometary data from that mission. The real NASA mission, named Stardust, launched an unmanned vehicle to collect material from Comet Vild 2. When the vehicle made contact with a comet tail, an arrow shield opened up like a clamshell. Then a collector grid deployed looking something like a tennis racket. 
The spaces in the grid were filled with a substance called aerogel. Comet and interstellar particles were caught in it, then the grid was folded back into the capsule to return to Earth. <laughs> so we simulated that with what we called aerogel-o, which we made out of um, gelatin. There is no real grid filled with aerogel in the student's mission, but they will have to navigate to a virtual comet, determine coordinates, and build a probe for a virtual launch. Throwing a nice little tail right there. It gave some indication as to where the particle went in, where it lodged, how fast it was going. So that's one of the methods that NASA uses to collect cometary dust and particles. To help students understand the physical problems astronauts might experience on a flight, they do an exercise called puffy head chicken leg. We were laying back so like because when they're in space the fluids like go up to your stomach and stuff and you lose fluids out of your legs. <laughs> I can't feel my toes. <laughs> After we're done with that, we had to stand up and it hurt a lot. Well at first it was asleep, then um and I felt like I was stepping on pins. Oh. Now I have more respect for um, astronauts. We've been doing some activities that promote communication and trust and the ability to count on each other because every job in the mission is equally important. If anyone falls down on their job, the whole mission could be in jeopardy. All the students have trained for specific jobs, and all of these mission jobs uh, imitate or simulate the jobs that actually occur on a space shuttle. And so um, they're all astronauts, but they're all first and foremost mission specialists. We're just supposed to communicate um, between mission control and the spacecraft and make sure the messages get sent correctly. The isolation team tests things in a certain lab, like stuff we're going to use. We're taking like samples and stuff and studying it all through the mission. Regulate the air pressure and the humidity and stuff like that. Make sure that there's enough oxygen in the spacecraft. I just record stuff. Right. Record what they're doing. Our duties are to check the astronauts, give them tests. Tell the probe where to go. Yeah, like to, when it rendezvous, or like, when it hits a comet, we gotta tell it like, when and where to hit and stuff. We build a probe and we um, launch it off and it's based on the calculations of the navigation team. On the second half of the trip, the class will explore ocean science. Creating animal brochures helps prepare students to identify marine life in the wild. But academics are only part of their training. Middle school children have social difficulties common to their age that could affect the mission. Treating each other with respect is also required. He's saying, let's work together. Okay, all right, that works. Did you understand that? That's a common thing you do when you say we're going to put our personal differences aside and doesn't mean we won't still have personal differences. It just means we're going to work together, okay? The fact that the mission is a simulation does affect some students' attitudes. It's a simulation, and if we get it right, then high five for us, but if we don't, it doesn't really matter. My past experience has said that once they get in there, they have done such an excellent job at the Challenger Learning Center to try to make it as absolutely real as possible for students that they forget that they're in a simulation. Deb Wilkinson original. Yeah, buck a ticket if you're in later. Preparing for the trip can also serve as a catalyst for personal growth. 
For example, the desire to make sure the trip is funded can spur a child to broaden personal limits for the good of the group. He's, he's not really shy, but he's, I wouldn't call him outgoing. Um, I was watching him there earlier, and he's kind of going out there and, and making the effort himself rather than waiting for somebody else. So it's kind of neat to see. Would you be interested in a quilt raffle? Would you be interested in a quilt raffle? By the time they're on the road, the students are prepared, academically and personally, to take on the tasks before them. It's been a long day of changing scenery and getting comfortable in their home away from home. Tomorrow will bring school away from school and their first tests, the mission and water slide math. middle school that's one of the best ways to motivate them is with food. The Challenger Learning Centers were created by the families of the astronauts who died in the shuttle accident of 1986. Their purpose is to encourage students to study math, science, and technology using space as a medium. Hanana middle school students, I'd like to welcome you to the Challenger Learning Center of Alaska. Flight directors work for the center and help the students during the mission. Their teachers and chaperones are not allowed to answer questions. The comet we're going to look for is called Comet Inky. Comet Inky comes by every 3.3 years. So it's a short period and we are going to go looking for it today. Before the mission begins, there is one important ceremony. The mission patch is a way to individualize the crew, the objective of the mission, and their ultimate goal. The mascot for Tanana Middle School is an eagle. The Lee Ward team chose to modify that mascot to become the Soaring Eagles. Okay, come on in and find your station. And just Finally, it's time. The it class is split into please. two groups, one for mission control. Good luck, guys. And the other for the spacecraft. When you go in, you, have, you hear that shuttle sound, and that was cool because you felt like you were really going up. Go and your job. Oh my god. The stations are written across the top. You came in the other side and the spacecraft had all these little gadget areas and stuff. So it was cool. The flight directors control a mission as it happens. If students handle the tasks too easily, the program can be made more difficult. Let's get to work. The mission program is interactive. Students use manuals to guide them through the tasks, but they must use their training to interpret instructions, input data, and communicate correctly to their team counterparts. This is using higher cognitive skills to move past rote learning. Spacecraft, this is mission control. Do you copy? When you're at mission control, you have to, like, tell people what to do. Because you see their screen, but you can't like move anything on it, so you have to tell them how to move it and stuff. We see it on our screen. Stand by over. First we had to like find uh, which uh, system it was in and then the coordinates it was in. There's a grid that had like a bunch of stars and the comet on it and it had numbers like one to ten. Space ground is mission control. The message for the ISO 2 team is if the robotic arm freezes up and stops working, wait five seconds and try again. Over. The isolation team monitors hazardous materials and micrometeoroid impact panels. Too many holes may mean a shower of particles that could disable the spacecraft and endanger the lives of the astronauts. The remote team also uses robotic arms to collect material, such as plants and rocks. And we use like the rubber gloves and the containment thing and the robotic arm sometimes. Just testing the rocks and seeing what's really in an asteroid. Medical teams monitor the astronauts' health. They have the authority to pull crew members to run medical tests. Covering your right eye. My duties were um, to monitor and um, monitor and implicate the, um, the humidity levels and oxygen levels and make sure that everybody could breathe right. Mission control 
Halfway through the mission, the crews leave their stations to exchange positions. Everyone experiences both sets of duties. During the debriefing, the class hears about an unexpected discovery. Would you like to go for this new comet that was just discovered by the navigation team out there in space that comes around every probably 6,000 years? Or do you want to stay on course for Comet Inky? That's going to be a decision you guys get to make. Who would like to stay on course for Comet Inky? Who would like to go for this new discovered comet? Okay, excellent. That's what we're going to go for then. Hello, this is the spacecraft. I have a message for the remote two team. Over. After the debriefing, the mission gets underway again. I see how this works. We want to send our probe through an area that's not high intensity. Otherwise, it would break apart. Yeah, and then that's fire. Okay. You shoot things. <laughs> it's like a video game. No. No, not that one. No, no, no. That cord that is the cord that is hooked up to the transceiver. And some team members are reacting to the simulation as if it were real, after all. I'm sitting here looking at it. You have the part still in. Okay, Eric, even though we don't need to use them, we still need those numbers, okay? It actually, at some points, makes you feel like you're making a difference with something, like, that big. Guys, we're not going to worry about that right now. We have to deal with this emergency first. Turn off, turn off filter B and E. So turn off B and E. Turn it off. BB4. BB4. One of the other teams had like, like opened some biohazardous material and it started leaking into the air system. Right here. Okay, they're seeing the valve that says BV1. Number two to green, number three red. Uh, that looks good. Yes. Uh, please ask the life support team to look at SS Cam 2. Ask them if, they, if that looks right to them. The, the people in um, the spacecraft kept getting it wrong, so I was getting kind of frustrated and I couldn't like take over um, the communication, just tell them what to do. David's probably freaking out. You idiots. Uh, they're going to die. I'm going bonkers. Yeah, I know, I'm going bonkers. Let's go out this way. Okay, good. Is there a fan? I think you got it. Okay, I understand all the oxygen emergency has been averted here because of the excellent job of the microphones and data communications officers. Let's give them a big round of applause. Yeah. I have to enter the codes. Yep. No, I did all your, You already did all of them. What teamwork? You guys are great. Final check before launch, okay? You're going to pull all your wires? So we're going to pull all the wires. Tell them to start working on the launch code. We're ready. Slide that. They're a lot close. After you turn off the power. Yeah, that's the power. Okay. Okay. We have a countdown on a mission status for eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Probe is deployed. And there on your data select screen, we have an image of a very well built probe built by the probe team. Congratulations, guys. Oh dear. Board says that we have lost contact with our probe. And I have to be honest with you, I know the probe team was having some trouble. They had some lights that weren't coming on. We were hoping it was just a light bulb that had burned out. It is possible that it was something more drastic than that. Um, yeah. Probe transceiver function restored. Looks like we're okay again. Yeah. Yeah. Sample collection is complete. The probe is functional. Congratulations, yeah. probe team. There you'll see an image of the coma with the nucleus and a blue filter. They're as unique as fingerprints on a person. We're now going to have an inner, inner, inner coma passage as the camera flies through the center of the comet. Mission successful. Congratulations to the All the work they did, all the learning of the math, all the science, all the writing, all the investigation they did, it was for a purpose, and it worked. 
The mission may be over, but the learning is not. In her zeal to show students how math and science affect every part of their lives, Lee turns a stop at the Nikiski pool into a physics lesson. We'll be studying Newton's laws there and the physics of water slides and uh, calculating and having contests about force, mass, and acceleration. try to incorporate level one science inquiry and some level two inquiries. Is it faster to go on your stomach, on your back, sitting up, lying down? Oh, that's, that's more than last time. Try again, but this time I'm doing my old-fashioned way. Using the water slide to determine calculations brings the abstract laws of physics into the tangible world and helps students face certain fears. I was kind of scared to go on the thing, but uh, yeah, it turned out really good. The next stop is Seward and activities in marine science. But first, the class heads to Seward High School, where they will spend the night. <laughs> Teamwork takes on a whole new meaning in the rain when it's late. Time out! Time out, wait! I enjoyed seeing kids who have not always been given credit for being really together, be some of the most together kids on this trip. When you're on the bus, it's really tiring, but when you get off, you just want to run around and everything. Oh, Kate's sleeping. Okay, sleeping so. It's for kids. They, they love it to be drug around in their sleeping bag by us while they're pretending that they just can't wake up. <laughs> We're going to do some stuff out on the boat, whether it rains, whether it's raining out there or not. The students will be going out into Resurrection Bay into the North Pacific Ocean to participate in science experiments on board. The Marine Science Explorer Program takes place on the Fjordlander, a floating laboratory designed to educate the public about Alaska's marine environment. Here, what do I have right here in my hand? Somebody tell me, carnivores, omnivores, herbivore, what, is it? what am I looking at here? He's an this is a carnivore. This one's a carnivore. Oh, oh God. Okay. This is a carnivore. This is a plankton section. Who can tell me what plankton is? Microscopic organisms. So I'm just going to pull it on deck and get our sample. So do you think that here, right here in some cove, our level of salt in the water is going to be higher or lower than the worldwide average? That is salt water. Did you guys figure out what our saloon is? <laughs> Educational research shows that activities using all the senses and eliciting an emotional response help people understand and remember information better. Like being in a washing machine. They internalize perhaps what um, 28 degrees Fahrenheit is or 46 degrees Fahrenheit. They also feel the and smell the ocean salt and the breeze in their face. It's cold, and I'm wearing my new coat, and it's still cold. Look around here, it's more than likely be a bald eagle or a falcon. Well, there's a lot out there, and I never thought there was. I thought it was just a bunch of water. I didn't think that that many things could live in the ocean. Learning what scientists must deal with to observe, track, and measure marine life in the wild prepares the students for the next step doing research in a controlled environment. The Alaska Sea Life Center is a nonprofit facility that focuses on marine ecosystem research, rehabilitation, and education. It offers a unique program of nocturne classes with an overnight stay. This place is so big and we get to sleep here. People on MTV, they have these big old mount mansions are all to themselves. And that's what it feels like for us. So we have animals and they don't. 
students will be taking classes into the evening related to the research going on at the Sea Life Center. Before the classes begin, the students are sent on a scavenger hunt to familiarize them with the animals. Oh, I didn't know it was that big. Like, we've only seen that much of him today, and then he just swam around, he's like, that long. Observation is good, but the Sea Life Center wants students to get into the guts of science, specifically squid guts. <laughs> They're so squishy. That's cool. Um, we took, like, there was, like, long-looking, like, plastic thing. Four of the broken <laughs> And we, like, dipped it in there and, like, wrote our names. When we want to go into the eye, you need to be very careful because you may have found out the eye is very juicy. And you'll find right something here. Stuff is all nasty in there. Cut it round right and hard oh, in there. Cut it right here. Any way you can. Any way you can. It's the lens of the eye. They actually have a round lens. Awesome. All the learning activities are over except one. To complete their social progress, the teachers have concocted an activity for extra credit. We're doing a, lo a lot of a dance thing. So right away, so right away, the soldier pine. When the war is over. I've watched kids make new friends, hang out with kids that they never talked to before. I mean, seriously, I never saw them in any of our, my classes. I've never seen those kids bond or, or talk, and, and that was fun to watch. They've all come out of their social shell, and I thought, well, you know, we really became a team. The bus turns homeward, but though the road is the same, the students are not. Reflecting about school on the road encourages students to find personal meaning in the trip. There's a lot more to learn that I didn't think I need to learn. When I went on the mission, I started wanting to be like a yeah. the dad team person. And then when I went to sea life, I wanted to scuba dive. I want to see a camel one day. I want to be like Steve on TV. <laughs> <laughs> go across the land with different animals and stuff. I guess now I'm not afraid to speak out loud. Everybody hear me. I need um, to learn to control my emotions and learn to, learn to cope with other people a little more so it's not so it's a lot smoother. Taking school on the road is more than a break from routine it's an extension of the classroom, where students see how education is a means to an end, an end that is ultimately up to them. All of our experiences were special. And when the students come to talk to you about them, it's never your worksheets, and it's never your perfect curriculum or your perfect room. It was always about human relationships and interaction and feeling like you belonged and the learning was yours. And it was something you could take with you, and it was useful, and you could move on with it in your life. 